In order to assess the dynamics of the further development of radio after the appearance of the first commercial radio stations and regular radio broadcasts, we will have to return to the United States of America as the country that made the greatest contribution to the development of radio. Giulielmo Marconi very quickly realized that he was very wrong in his predictions about the lack of prospects for commercial radio broadcasting as a business and began intensively to correct his mistake. In 1922, his company, American Telephone and Telegraph Company, began to create the first network of commercial radio stations in the United States of America, which broadcast music, news and a little later, information about the 1924 presidential election to an audience of 12 million listeners. This caused huge interest in radio and greatly increased its authority. In 1926, under the leadership of David Sarnov and with the participation of RCA, General Electric and Westinghouse Corporations, the radio broadcasting company NBC, National Broadcasting Company was formed, on the basis of which the largest network of 24 commercial radio stations in the United States was created. In 1927, another broadcasting monopoly was created, CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System, which was joined a little later by ABC, American Broadcasting Company. The number of radio stations and networks was constantly growing, and a fierce battle began between them for radio listeners and, of course, for advertisers' money. The rapid growth of radio stations, and by 1927 their number in the USA had already reached 740, led to the fact that there was an urgent need to regulate the use of radio frequencies. Because radio stations had already begun to interfere with each other, often working on the same frequencies. In 1927, Congress passed special legislation and created the Federal Radio Broadcasting Commission, whose task was to allocate these radio frequencies and issue the corresponding licenses. After the adoption of the law on radio, the number of radio stations began to grow sharply again and increased from 740 in 1927 to more than 6,000 in 1930. And it was already a real boom. No other branch of the economy developed so dynamically at that time. And what about the manufacturers? The year 1923 can be considered the beginning of mass interest of the population in radio, precisely as a reaction to the creation of a network of radio stations by the AT&T Corporation. It was then that radio receivers in the United States ceased to be an object of interest exclusively for radio amateurs, and due to the appearance of radio stations in all American states. Radio began to attract more and more radio listeners. The radio boom was beginning, and as the most practical and enterprising nation in the world, enterprising America entered a new race. The race to manufacture radio receivers and equipment for radio reception. In 1923, there were about half a million radio receivers in use, and in the 30th year there were already 12 million which were owned by more than 40% of the country's families. A prominent role in the spread and development of radio was played by David Sarnov, a native of Russia, the manager of the RCA Corporation. Created in 1919 by the Electrical Engineering Corporation's General Electric and Westinghouse. As a pioneer in the production of mass radio receivers, RCA rapidly increased production and sales. But the competitors were not too far behind. In the 20th, 22nd years, such veteran companies as Federal, DeForest, Kennedy, Brunswick, Sonora put their products on the market of quality radio. These were quality radios, but expensive due to the high cost of production. And it was difficult for them to compete with a whole galaxy of such new companies as Atwater Kent, Crossley, Zenit, 
which were created by businessmen entrepreneurs and whose products were much cheaper and more technological in the production of high quality, but cheap radio. It was the latter who survived the competitive battle and became RCA's main opponents. But, there is one, but, here, as you know, it was RCA that had a monopoly on the production of superheterodynes and categorically refused to share patents with its competitors. Having received such a huge advantage, RCA became the sole leader of the United States of America in the production of the most modern, most advanced and prestigious radio devices during the 20s. Of course, this destroyed competition and restrained the development of radio technology during this period. Because as you know, competition is the engine of development of science, production, trade and the whole society. So even such main competitors of RCA as Atwater Kent, Zenith, Crossley, Stromberg Carlson, Majestic, and from the 28th year and Philco until the expiration of the patent in 1930 were forced to manufacture only direct amplification radio receivers and regenerators, which were technologically quite inferior to superheterodynes. And here it should be noted that they succeeded perfectly in the lower and middle price segments, but by no means in the class of expensive prestigious radios. And here it is necessary to mention one more phenomenon of American radio, which even now is of great interest to modern collectors, and at the time of its appearance in the mid-twenties. It was generally an attribute of affluence, wealth and sophisticated taste. As you probably guessed, the conversation will be about my favorite radio consoles. For the United States, this is such a unique phenomenon that almost until the mid-30s, these beautiful and stylish devices were popular only in the United States of America and partly in Great Britain and Canada. And even when they finally appeared in Europe in the mid-30s, 50s, they were never as popular as in progressive America. Information for comparison, on the American market in the 30s from the 40s to the 55 the percentage was occupied by radio stations. It's hard to even imagine, it's about half of 40 million, it's even unpleasant to remember what kind of radio was listened to in the USSR back then. In essence, then these were universal home mass media, family recreation clubs or interest clubs in the company of men over a mug of beer. In terms of sound quality at that time, even when receiving radio stations, these devices had no competitors, and even more so when playing gramophone records. Perhaps we will be very surprised, but it was then that the terms hi-fi, high fidelity appeared and the first audio files appeared, fans of high quality sound reproduction. And maybe there will be a separate video about this story soon. And what happened in Europe at that time? and about the development of radio broadcasting and radio industry in Europe in the next video.